as Will alluded to. I, I came up with this title a couple of months ago, two months ago, uh, when Trudy needed the title. And uh, obviously things have changed, so we would, we would probably look at changing it to uh, probably more like $7 corn uh, is what it's looking like here in the near future. So um, uh, that being said, I'm going to do just a little brief background of kind of what the current situation is looking forward. Hopefully my numbers match up with Steve Myers here in another, uh, another hour. Uh, they should because some of this information I've, I've gotten from Steve. But, uh, you know, it, it looks like when you look at a number of different uh, projections uh, that we're looking at somewhere around uh, $60 per hunter weight live uh, as being the the kind of the average for this upcoming year for, for hog prices. Um, this is a pretty significant increase from this past year, uh, about 7% over what the average was for 2010. Um, and uh, production costs, however, we see are going to be running probably at least that $60 per hundred weight or potentially higher as we see as some of the projections for uh, grain prices uh, coming out. So, uh, you know, this is based on six and a half to seven dollar corn. Uh, the issue here is that's, that's about an 85% uh, increase from the average corn price that we had here in 2010. So obviously an 85% increase trumps the 7% increase that we're going to see in hog prices. Um, so, um, I apologize that's uh, old line down there, but, but uh, what we're looking at in the near future here is potentially um, looking at around uh, a break even or uh, perhaps a slight, um, a slight profit or slight uh, loss. What I'm not going to cover here is risk management strategies, but I think it's pretty apparent that that's one of the really key things uh, for producers here moving forward in this volatile type market is how do you protect yourself from uh, these types of significant uh, increases in input prices or also uh, potential significant decreases in, in hog prices. Um, here's a chart, uh, Steve Meyer actually put it together, but it shows um, some actual and predicted hog production costs and prices uh, based on uh, Iowa State model. And as you can see, in 2010, the forecast or the estimate was that uh, producers on average made right around $10 a head on hogs. But in 2011, um, particularly uh, as we get to the end of 2011, when we're going to potentially see a, a drop in, in hog prices, uh, we're going to see perhaps right around break even, perhaps a slight profit, but, but certainly uh, nothing near uh, the situation that we've had this past year. So the situation looks uh, kind of bleak as we look, uh, look out this next year, particularly in the next uh, in six to nine months from now. So what do we do? Well, one thing I think we need to recall is that farmers are resourceful. Uh, they will take advantage of what they've got currently and try to come up with a solution. Sometimes the solution may not always seem to be the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the safest or may, maybe the most prudent, but maybe it gets the job done. Other times, maybe it doesn't look pretty, but you're going to maximize the value out of what you have uh, available to you. Uh, all joking aside though, uh, some things that we can do uh, is uh, try to reassess our goals for our operation and reassess our different areas throughout the system to ensure that we're going to maximize our return for our investment and particularly our return on feed cost for the pork that we produce. Understand an important key point here, particularly when we're talking about high feed prices uh, in comparison to hog prices, is that we're trying to maximize or optimize that return. That does not necessarily mean that we're trying to maximize performance. Um, a key differentiation there. Um, and so this is where records come into play. You need to evaluate your current production levels. You need to try to evaluate different scenarios um, and see where it makes sense uh, based on 
your feed costs and feed feed formulation uh, and and estimated performance uh, where you should be feeding these animals and and uh, what makes most economic sense. <clears throat> Different ways we can return uh, maximize return. We need to look at uh, certainly if we can decreasing the cost of production and or increasing revenue that we're getting from our production. But again, we're looking for a mix of that that helps us optimize our uh, returns. So again, looking at feed and other production costs, but then also evaluating our pig performance and our carcass value and how we do changes it within the system and how it affects these three is going to be really key. Uh, some different areas that we really need to look at and evaluate would include our, our genetics, uh, where you're at genetically and, and, and how you compare not only to the industry but, but also how the rest of your system uh, applies and fits with your genetics. Animal health uh, is going to be very key. Uh, we're going to look at diets and feeding management and then we also need to assess our environment and also our, our marketing, uh, making sure that we're good, doing a good job in all of these areas. So we look more specifically at that gene genetic merit. Understand that genetics are what drive what's possible. Not necessarily what we achieve on the farm, but what would be possible for performance, be it growth performance or reproductive performance. Uh, also certainly, of course, we generally figure that uh, if we have a decrease in performance, that's going to increase our cost per pig um, because we're getting less productive value out of that pig for what we're uh, putting into it. So, and as we've, we've certainly gone and the, and the trend has been for, for many years here, we keep increasing our market weight, we keep uh, looking at having extremely lean pigs, later maturing hogs, and so um, if you look at different data, and it could be data looking across different genetic lines, it could be data across individuals within genetic lines, understand that there's going to be quite amount of variation that you can see uh, between different individuals or different genetic lines. Sometimes we tend to fall into this, um, this thought process of, of all pigs kind of being the same. Um, they're all going to perform the same and as much as we try to minimize variation at time, there certainly is a fair amount of variation. And that being said, if we aren't measuring and we aren't aware of where we're at lean gain per day, we really can't guess, we don't have an idea of where we stand on this uh, chart. A big issue with this and trying to maximize lean uh, accretion or lean growth per day is the fact that when you look at lean tissue compared to fatty tissue, lean tissue is about two-thirds to three-fourths water compared to fatty tissue which is maybe 10 percent water. It's a lot more efficient to put on water weight than it is to put on weight be it from lipid or per protein. So that's, that's where you really pick up some efficiencies and some, um, some improved value uh, is if you can increase uh, lean growth as compared to uh, more fatty type growth. Also again kind of going back to genetics 101 here realizing understanding that when we are trying to uh, improve and maximize our genetics we want to be maximizing heterosis as much as possible but uh, when we're doing that also realizing that heritability uh, we can really affect those traits that are influenced by growth and, and carcass type traits uh, whereas we're going to have a, a, a much slower uh, effect on proving uh, reproductive traits. Okay, So uh, moving on to animal health uh, certainly we know animal health is important. We don't want to have animals getting sick. That certainly costs us uh, a lot of uh, money, but oftentimes disease that affects our bottom line, it might be more a subclinical type disease versus clinical where we can see. Uh, subclinical diseases such as uh, ileitis, some of these other types of, of digestive type diseases particularly can um, really have an impact on your bottom line and if you, if you aren't keeping good records, aren't tracking uh, growth rate compared to what you would expect for your your group, you might not be able to pick up on um, some of these issues. Um, certainly when pigs reduce their feed intake, one of the uh, the side effects, the uh, negative side effects would be that uh, a greater proportion of those nutrients that the pig is consuming yet are going to now be going more to maintenance and less to growth. 
So as, as feed intake decreases, generally you're going to say that feed, feed efficiency gets poor. Also, uh, when an animal is under a subclinical disease situation, although you may not be able to observe uh, signs of disease, understanding that, that immune system of that pig is being activated. And that activation uh, takes energy and takes, uh, takes nutrients away from what would otherwise be a productive uh, value. Here's a study that was done in North Carolina State uh, actually a few years back, but I think it really highlights well what kind of uh, results on performance we see with pigs uh, that are under uh, disease uh, situations or just situations where their immune systems have been activated. Uh, as you'll note here, we'll see a, a decrease in feed intake, but actually a more pronounced decrease in growth performance. Uh, certainly a reduction in, in uh, feed conversion. Uh, when you look at the carcass itself, pigs actually will, will uh, tend to increase their uh, amount of fat deposition in comparison to lean, so certainly that's not a positive. And so um, uh, certainly have a lot of negative effects there of, of activating the immune system. So what kind of things can we do? Uh, a big thing, of course, is prevention of, of uh, disease. Uh, just to review some things that uh, if you've gone through PQA Plus, they do a really nice job of highlighting, but, but uh, looking at biosecurity and being very strict and consistent with that biosecurity. Uh, be it uh, use of clothing or boots, or if you're doing shower in, shower out, uh, controlling uh, activity of rodents, birds, other animals, um, controlling traffic between barns and certainly across different farms, uh, minimizing vehicle traffic, um, all these things are really key. Um, I think, you know, certainly almost uh, nearly all of our production now we use uh, all in, all out uh, production, and, and, but that's really key and important to breaking that disease cycle, making sure that we do a good job of cleaning and disinfecting between those groups. Then we also want to make sure we can do anything else we can to minimize stress on the pigs. Uh, you know, if, if we've got improper diets or we've got anything uh, improper in the environment, that's going to stress the, the, the pigs, and that activates the immune system. Uh, certainly if, if we don't use good animal handling techniques, that will stress the animal. So uh, one of the key things here, the, the tendency is when we have uh, economic situations where it's at is to, to cut costs. So maybe one of the things you would think is, well, the vet doesn't need to come out this quarter. No, that's actually uh, probably the opposite of what you need to be doing. You've got to make sure your health plan is up to date. So make sure you're consulting with the veterinarian, understanding what your current health status is and um, what you should be doing from vaccination treatment standpoint, making sure that the products uh, that you're using, the health products, are appropriate and are needed for uh, what your current health status is in your herd. Um, also an important key here that people maybe don't think about as much is that you need to make sure that you establish and enforce a good euthanasia program. Well, how does this result to your, your bottom line? Well, um, the tendency is for producers not to euthanize as many pigs as they probably should. Being livestock producers, you naturally want to make those animals get better, care for them, uh, but oftentimes we're caring for pigs that will never uh, fully recover. And so in those, cons those times, you need to consider uh, if it makes sense to, to euthanize those pigs. Uh, poor doing pigs tend to consume disproportionate amounts of feed in comparison to the amount of gain that they actually have. So they're certainly very inefficient in, in gain. Uh, also, certainly you'll have the extra expense of medications typically with those animals compared to your, your normal stock. And then you've got the, the, the typhoid Mary effect where uh, those pigs tend to harbor uh, some diseases that uh, can keep a subclinical level of disease within the herd. Um, so uh, we need to, to uh, try to make sure we, we control that. And part of it also is making sure we're doing a good job observation-wise, walking through those pens day-to-day -day basis, uh, catching those pigs that may just be starting to, to not feel quite 100% and uh, taking a quick and uh, accurate um, treatment uh, immediately. Okay, moving on to our feeding program. Um, here is, is an opportunity or an area that where you can potentially uh, help yourself out quite a bit, uh, both from a uh, 
a cost standpoint and also potentially on a improvement of revenue standpoint. Going back to Nutrition 101 here, understanding that uh, pigs need nutrients in really in amounts per day. And we always are talking about what's the percent lysine in the diet, what's the percent uh, or the density of, of energy in the diet. But we, we kind of tend to forget the other half of that equation, which is feed intake. Both of those are key because that ultimately uh, determines what's the amount of that nutrient the pig gets per day, and that's really what we're targeting and what we need to be aware of. So if you have situations, be it seasonal or disease situations or whatever, that uh, affect the feed intake, really that should be affecting our concentration in the diet also to ensure that we're still meeting those pig's nutritional needs. Uh, how do we determine what the, the pig's needs are? Well, we need to know what that lean growth is, uh, that lean growth level in those pigs. So um, don't just think that oh, I've got high lean pigs, so it must be about this many grams per day. No, you need to, you need to measure that. Um, you can estimate it pretty well just based on your, your carcass and packer data and then uh, estimating what your, your incoming weight is on those pigs and uh, you, you can estimate what the, the lean body uh, protein level is in those pigs and, and do that estimate. Um, we've actually got uh, the new National Swine Nutrition Guide. There's a software with that that has a nutrient estimator. big part of that is you can just input your, your carcass data in there and uh, your estimated starting weight and you can come up with a, an estimate of lean growth right there. The key is however way you come about finding it that you do get that measurement and that you track that uh, you don't just take the measurement once and then, and then just assume that, okay, that, that's the growth level that we're at. Um, you need to, to check it periodically. Um, a lot of producers will base their feeding programs on information that they've got from their genetic supplier. Understand that uh, particularly nutrient, re nutrient recommendations and expected growth rates from genetic suppliers are really more like what is the potential, okay? And if you're doing everything right on the farm, you've got excellent health, then you might be able to reach that potential. But in a lot of farms, we have something else in the environment, or maybe it's with our diets or feeding program, that will limit performance of those pigs to where it's not actually at that level provided by the, by the supplier. So that supplier, we need to review that number as our goal uh, in some ways, or as our benchmark of what is possible. Um, but we need to actually measure on the farm what we currently have and then use that to evaluate our feeding programs and see if we're correctly meeting nutrient needs, if we're overfeeding or underfeeding nutrients, and uh, where we need to go to from there. A couple basic things here I'm sure you've, you've run across and, and seen before. Phase feeding. Um, Basically, you know, the goal here is to try to minimize the amount of nutrients that we're over or under feeding. So we're going to be feeding multiple diets throughout the lifetime of that pig. You know, if we look at an example here, we're only going to have two diets in the grow finish period. One grower, one finisher diet. There's quite a bit of area here that is above the line, which is the actual nutrient requirement for the pig. Everything above that line would indicate excess nutrients that we're providing in the diet. And more times than not, that generally means we're spending more on the diet than we necessarily need to. By increasing the number of phases, then of course, what we're trying to do and what we do end up doing is minimizing that area above that line and therefore minimize the amount of nutrients that we're oversupplying. Ultimately trying to meet that pig's nutrients requirements throughout the lifetime without overly uh, excessively providing uh, nutrients. The challenge here is that not all pigs are equal and so we do need to account for some variation within our groups of pigs. We need to account for a safety margin and so we do need to provide a slightly higher level of, of nutrients than what um, would be kind of the baseline requirements for those pigs. Uh, but again, this, this just underlies the importance of phase feeding. Now, how many phases do you use? That's a good question. We generally look at doing that from a standpoint of uh, how much does our bins hold for feed? And that can be a good route. Uh, the, the one challenge is the more phases that we have, the more management that's involved keeping track of those. And also understand that there's an inherent amount of variability 
in mixing equipment, ingredients themselves, and so to a certain point, we um, we will always have some variation, no matter how much we try to control it. Now, what surprises me some is that uh, we still have a lot of people that aren't split sex feeding. It might be because uh, it's a challenge in those barns, uh, or it's extra time uh, spent to to split the sexes of those pigs. Uh, I know some people like having mixed uh, sex pens because when you go to load those pens out, you start pulling the barrels out and you've got some more room for the, the gilts in there to catch up. Um, but understand, uh, we still have a, a significant difference between barrels and gilts. From a growth performance standpoint, those barrels are certainly going to eat more and they're going to grow more faster and they're going to reach their mature body weight quicker. But those uh, gilts are the ones that are going to be more efficient and uh, more lean. And thus, just thinking about the differences in accretion of lean versus uh, fat tissue and, and related to lean tissue accretion and growth rate, they're, they're significantly different. And I think you're, particularly in times of here when margins are tight, you're missing some opportunities to capture some extra value by split sex feeding and thus having two separate lines, one for barrels, one for gilts, and not either overfeeding barrels or underfeeding gilts at any given time. Feed budgeting, uh, we all talk about it, we implement it, but how many times do we actually check to see if our feed budgets are what is occurring in the barn? Uh, periodically, we need to be checking on, okay, when we're changing these diets, is the average pig weight at the weight that we expect it to be for, or that we plan for in that feed budget. Okay, is that pig weight correct? Uh, any slight changes in feed intake in those pigs, or growth rate, is going to change that to where our budget can uh, get thrown off fairly quickly. So we need, to, we need to be checking those feed budgets periodically to make sure that they, what we have on paper matches uh, what's going on in the barn. Um, alternative ingredients, um, certainly when we have corn or any other of our main ingredients increase in price, first thing we want to do and our tendency to do is, is say, okay, what else can I look at feeding? Um, and it, it is something that we definitely need to do. That being said, we need to keep some, some things in mind. Uh, again, go back to the idea that we're, we're providing nutrients. And so, no, we don't have to feed corn to our pigs. We can feed pigs other ingredients and they can still get all the nutrients that they need. Um, also understand that uh, as we're providing those nutrients, energy is going to be the most costly uh, uh, nutrient that we're providing on a total basis, followed by our protein, amino acids, and then you look at phosphorus and some of our other uh, minerals. So the, the next thing is a really key point here. We need to make sure that we're using correct formulation techniques and that we're using digestible nutrient levels uh, when we're evaluating these alternatives and formulating them in diets. Um, you know, we've, we've been able to get away oftentimes with just plain corn soybean meal diets looking at total levels. Uh, but when we look at alternative ingredients, there can be significant differences in digestibility. And ultimately, what we're, we're trying to establish is what, uh, how, do, how do we get about that nutrient level that the pig can actually utilize and will incorporate it for maintenance or for uh, production. Um, also kind of think down the road a little bit. There might be a great buy on something at one given time, but is it a consistent plot supply? Is it uh, something uh, that we can kind of rely on and, and kind of incorporate into the future? And, and that really gets down to your goals. Are, are you willing to be switching ingredients in and out, uh, or are you looking for something more consistent? Uh, there are going to be some ingredients that for brief periods of time are available and or at a good price, but will not necessarily remain that way. Then of course make sure there aren't any other factors that would negatively impact feed intake, growth, carcass value, uh, things such as uh, mycotoxins, um, uh, foreign debris, those kinds of items. So. There's a lot of different things we can look at. We can look at other grain sources. We can look at co-products. Of course, the big thing that we are, are looking at and, and that a lot of people are feeding in this area would be the distiller's dried grains that, would, that is the co-product from the ethanol plants. Um, we've got a lot of distiller's grains. As more and more corn is being utilized in ethanol plants, 
we're having a lot and lot more distillers grains being available. And certainly in the in the the recent past, they have priced very favorably on a nutritional standpoint in comparison to uh, corn. And uh, even though the uh, the amino acid profile is 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 not ideal, uh, we can still replace some of the soybean meal and do it in a very economical fashion. Um, we're still uh, not the, the livestock group that utilizes distillers grains the best. When you look at it from a dollars and cents standpoint, uh, distillers grains really fits in nicely in beef and dairy rations. But at current prices right now, you can have some substantial savings also including it in swine and poultry rations. Um, some things that we need to keep in mind, and these aren't necessarily just concerns on distillers, but this would be really in general for uh, any kind of coal product you might be evaluating. You know, what are those nutrient levels? How variable can the uh, nutrient levels be? Do we have some potential issues for mycotoxins? You know, this is a concern every fall is, is okay, are, are we seeing mycotoxins in the field and therefore are we going to see mycotoxin problems in the distillers? understand that mycotoxins, uh, if we've got a certain mycotoxin level in the corn that's going into the plant, we're essentially going to triple that concentration of that mycotoxin in the distiller's product that's, that's remaining. <coughs> Flowability and handling, you know, uh, if based on the source that we're getting, are we having some negative impacts on flowability and handling, uh, or is it a product that, uh, that works in our system very well? Some past research that we've looked at was that would indicate you could certainly include 10 to 20 percent distillers without having any uh, appreciable effect on performance in grow finish pigs. Uh, you can go 30, 40 percent in gestating sow diets uh, fairly, uh, fairly well also without uh, having any impact on performance and 10 to 20 percent. That being said, a lot of people are pushing the limit and going higher than these levels and uh, certainly not saying that you can't go higher, but understand that as we push the limit, as we go to 30 or 40 percent in grow finish diets, for instance, we could have some potential negative impacts. One concern is going to be carcass quality. Uh, as we increase the level of distiller's grains, what we're essentially doing is increasing the level of corn oil in the diet. We end up with a much more unsaturated fat source, and it results in uh, softer fat, the belly fat, um, back fat, and so this can cause some issues from a uh, from a uh, quality standpoint. It can cause some issues from a, a processing standpoint for the packer, um, and so that's something we need to continually evaluate and look at. Um, also, uh, certainly when you get up to 30, 40 percent, we probably start seeing some slight decreases in performance of those pigs. But that doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. Um, we need to evaluate that compared to what we're saving and see if we're maximizing return. Yes? If we push 40% on sow diets, gestation diets, is there anything else besides the vitamin E, selenium thing that's going to creep up? There? Um, good question. Uh, I, we really haven't seen too much uh, for other issues. The, the, the one thing is when you're first starting these sows, you can have some palatability issues. Uh, but once you get them accustomed to the distillers and the diets, uh, I, you know, from, from most things I've heard out in the field, uh, producers have been very happy. They've been feeding at 40%. Some people have gone up to 60% uh, distillers, um, quite high. But yes, there's, there is that uh, one item you need to think about, vitamin E, selenium levels, potential for mulberry heart disease. And, so, and that's where, when you're pushing these levels, you really need to make sure you're working with a nutritionist. Uh, to ensure that all your other nutrient specs are in line and, and will we'll work with that. Uh, we even have some research that would suggest that if we're going into these higher levels of distillers in the sow diets, we might actually be seeing an improvement in litter size in subsequent reproductive cycles. Uh, we're adding some fiber in the diet when we're feeding those distillers grains. And there has been some past research with other fiber sources that would indicate improvement in litter size. And some preliminary research that we've done here at the university would, would also indicate that we might see, be seeing an improvement in litter size, a second and third subsequent uh, reproductive cycle. Um, that being said, whatever your level is you have in gestation sow diets, our suggestion would be that you keep some distillers in there, but you probably cut the level down to about half of what you have in the gestation sow diet. And then 
Uh, that way the sows remain uh, accustomed to that distiller's grains and they, they appear to do quite well performance-wise uh, during the lactation period. Everything really gets down to economics and so certainly that's, that's the big deal and that's, that's going to base a lot of your decisions on whether or how much distillers to include in the diet. Um, you, you need to look at your current inclusion levels and what your substitution levels would be. Here's just an example. If I was going to put 10% distillers in the diet of a corn soy diet, uh, you know, in this example, uh, what is that opportunity cost? If you do the calculations based on how much corn, soybean meal, and uh, dical or monocal uh, phosphorus source that you're going to replace, uh, because distillers grains is also an excellent source of available phosphorus. Uh, in this scenario, based on um, uh, $6.30 corn, $360 per ton soybean meal, uh, and then um, as you can see with these calculations, what you end up uh, figuring out that is that you could pay up to $250 a ton for distiller's grain. Well, uh, at the current market, say at $180 per ton, um, you know, that savings can be quite substantial. You're looking at around $7.5 $7 per ton. So if we were to go up to 20%, you're looking at $15 per ton savings and where you're, you're really expecting to have a minimal or no impact uh, negatively on revenue. So that, that should be pretty much uh, a pure uh, improvement in profitability. Uh, some producers have noticed a, a slight uh, decrease in uh, carcass yield. Uh, so that's, but that's been quite variable. Uh, we see it in some, with some producers, uh, not in other cases. Uh, that might be an issue of, of uh, correct formulation of those diets, uh, uh, whether or not the, the animals are actually getting the correct amount of amino acids or not. <clears throat> some other things that we need to evaluate and consider. Uh, growth promotants. Uh, the idea here, of course, is that we're going to get more out of what we're feeding from a nutrient standpoint, trying to improve the efficiency of utilization. Uh, certainly antibiotics when you look at the young pig and particularly in, um, in conditions that maybe are less than ideal, you'll see some uh, improvements, maybe 5 to 10 percent improvement in growth rate, uh, about half of that in improvement in uh, feed conversion. Uh, but there's other uh, other, there's other products out there and certainly as you walk the trade floor you're going to see a lot of different uh, alternative type products, uh, be they prebiotics, direct fed microbials, botanicals, um, diet acidifiers, different enzymes, that, that may make some sense and, and hold some value in um, improving the efficiency of, of, use, uh, of utilization of nutrients which when we're looking at high feed costs uh, can provide a substantial return. Uh, the big thing I think is when you're trying to evaluate those, try to see what's there for research. Uh, often that's, that's kind of our uh, concern or our, our, um, our not concern necessarily, but, but it's, it's kind of an issue that we have is just that, you know, we'd like to see more research. Some of these products are fairly new coming out on the market um, and trying to understand how consistent that response might be. But there's a lot of potential there. Uh, an item that's been used quite a bit the last several years would be uh, ractopamine. Um, and again, realizing that uh, you know that's going to increase lean growth, utilize at the end of the finishing period. Uh, if we're going to use it, uh, uh, typical inclusion rate might be the last uh, four weeks, three four weeks of uh, of uh, finishing at about four and a half gram level. What we're going to do here is is improve feed conversion and growth by about a 10 to 15 percent level and so um, it can be pretty easy to do the economics there, do a partial budgeting and see how much value that can potentially uh, provide you uh, to include that at the end of the end of the finishing period. Some other things we can look at from a feeding management standpoint um, you know now might be a time to con consider pelleting um, when feed costs are relatively uh, cheap, uh, certainly up in this area, it really doesn't make sense to, to pellet diets unless it's those really early uh, diets where you've got some extremely expensive ingredients and you're trying to minimize feed wastage. Uh, but when we've got higher feed costs uh, throughout the production period, we need to compare that cost of, of getting the, the diets pellet, 
relative to the uh, improvement we can see in, in feed conversion, which is ultimately the result of less feed wastage. Um, we also tend to see a slight improvement in energy utilization uh, sometimes in these, these kind of products. So uh, again, that's something that you should evaluate, look at in your situation, see if it makes sense. Um, for those that have on-farm feed manufacturing facilities or you're considering that, uh, certainly understand that from a cost standpoint, you can have some cost savings there by, by doing the, 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 the mixing of the feed uh, yourself, but on the, the flip side of that, you're undertaking uh, a lot more issues from a management standpoint. You need to make sure you're maintaining that equipment. Uh, you need to take into account the energy usage you're going to have, the time, the labor that's involved. But uh, probably utmost is the amount of management that, that's involved in making sure that you've got uh, a good quality control system in place. Quality control would be uh, looking at things such as uh, nutrient specs, nutrient levels, both in ingredients and the final, um, final feeds. Are they matching what they're supposed to be or what we're assuming on paper? Also, uh, do we have presence of uh, other items such as mycotoxins? And, um, and another thing would be to, to uh, again, it doesn't matter whether you, you're uh, producing the feed yourself or you're having it commercially produced, uh, you need to be evaluating particle size from time to time. Okay. Um, typically, or traditionally, we've suggested somewhere around 650 to 750 microns as being the size you should target. In times of high feed costs such as this, <coughs> you need to examine the potential of decreasing that perhaps some more. Okay. Uh, we're generally looking at an improvement about 1 to 1.5% 1 in feed conversion rate for every 100 microns that we decrease. And so you might want to start evaluating decreasing that sum, keeping in mind that uh, the, the negative, potential negative, is, is increasing gastric ulcers. Uh, so you certainly don't want to increase it significantly right away. You want to decrease it some, evaluating how the pigs are doing. Uh, and if, if you're not having uh, any health issues related to gastric ulcers, uh, perhaps that's a good level, or perhaps you even want to consider more uh, some more. But uh, that's another area that, that we can look at to try to uh, squeeze a little bit more utilization of the nutrients and the feeds that we're providing. Uh, certainly need to do a good job of feeder management. Uh, Kansas State's got some really nice pictures demonstrating what proper feed management should be, and I think uh, anybody that got working in the barns uh, it, it's a really good training tool, something that they, they should have around available to, to view and to remind themselves what the feeder should look like. Um, you know, this is not a, a situation we want to see in a feeder trough. We're going to get a lot of feed wastage here. We're generally looking at about one half or maybe a little over half of the feeder trough being covered when, we're, when we've got young pigs that we're starting out. Uh, but after that, you, you really like, want to have a half or maybe a third of the feed trough covered. Uh, some people prefer even more like a fourth of the feed trough covered. Um, so you're, you're looking at something more like this situation of, of what the, the feeder setting should be. Or if you're in the situation of a wet dry type feeder, this is uh, kind of what that should be looking like if you've got the right, right setting. So, um, And like with all these other things, you, you set it, but then you periodically check it because um, those settings can change. Uh, pigs can move things around. Uh, so it's kind of a constant thing you need to be checking and be aware of. Um, just a little bit on ingredient purchasing. Um, if you are mixing your own feeds, uh, it's, it's generally a, a decreased cost the more volume you can buy. So uh, whether it means, does, does it make sense to have some extra bins up to store more ingredient or perhaps do some shared purchasing with other producers, maybe in a cooperative type of a setup. Uh, you might be able to, to decrease some of your input costs that way from an ingredient standpoint. Then of course, finishing up, we want to make sure that our environment is suitable. We can um, uh, lose a lot of potential revenue or increase our costs pretty quickly if we aren't properly managing our environment. Um, look at the ventilation system. The vast majority of our, of our heat loss in swine facilities, which is a pretty big deal this time of the year, uh, will happen be, uh, due to the ventilation system. So we need to make sure we're monitoring or correctly uh, setting those ventilation systems so that we're still removing moisture and noxious gases out of the barn, but we aren't excessively removing that to the point where we're, we're wasting energy. 
You know, and a big thing also was temperature control. I, I still tend to see in a lot of um, barns, particularly with younger pigs, the temperature tends to be on the high side, uh, and um, and so we're spending extra money on uh, propane, uh, on heating those barns, uh, where we could drop the, the temp slightly and uh, still be in, in good shape. You know, we're looking at environmentally trying to meet that pig's ideal comfort zone. It's going to obviously depend on the size of the pig and situation, but um, if we're in that thermal zone, you've got a, a, your, your maximal uh, growth performance, you've got your, your best feed conversion levels, and you see where your, your feed take is, is uh, relatively consistent through that. But as we go to temperatures that are too hot, feed intake starts to decrease. Uh, that reduces the amount of nutrients for growth, so obviously we see a reduction in growth, and thus the growth that does occur is much less efficient. Opposite end, if those pigs are too cold, and, and we need to be aware of that and be concerned with that also because uh, that's more costly for us in situations with high feed costs. You know, we're going to have pigs start increasing feed intake in an attempt to increase their heat production. Um, they'll do that to a point, and then uh, if they're too cold, we'll start seeing a reduction in growth rate. And a uh, result of all that, uh, of course, is a, a decrease in feed conversion. Uh, here's uh, some work done at Iowa State by Jay Harmon, looking at uh, just a comparison of how much two degrees in a nursery barn can make on uh, energy usage. And in this example, it was $1.48 per gallon propane. And decreasing the, the temperature from 78 degrees down to 76 degrees, which was still in that pig's comfort zone, um, in a thousand head uh, nursery. Uh, you can see the, uh, the, the savings there dropped uh, annual cost from 1700 down to uh, about 1400 and a half. Um, and that's just with two degrees. If, if we're running heat high, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of barns are perhaps three or four degrees uh, higher than maybe they need to be. Uh, you can start seeing uh, significant differences there. And, and this is just uh, using a, a thousand head nursery as an example. I'm going to finish up with marketing. Just a couple of remarks here. Um, you know, we need to be continually evaluating. Uh, where it makes the most sense for us to be selling our pigs, uh, where we're going to have our contracts at, and then we need to make sure that we're marketing our pigs at that correct weight, keeping in mind not only the packer grid, but keeping in mind that, okay, if I want to increase my average weight another two pounds, what's that extra added cost compared to what I'm going to get for revenue? In times of feed costs, it might not make sense. It oftentimes will not make sense here to increase your um, your uh, marketing weight to the top of that packer's ideal grid weight versus the bottom. Uh, again, you need to look at your records, crunch those numbers, and determine that on an individual basis. Um, but you know, when we have relatively inexpensive uh, corn and inexpensive feed, it's pretty much a no-brainer position. We tend to put, try to hit the, the top of that packer grid to maximize revenue. Time to high feed cost. That's not necessarily the case. We need to make sure that we're evaluating that. Um, and this just uh, shows that, you know, just the differences that you can see between different genetic lines on the efficiency and the cost of adding extra weight. And this is an older study uh, back when they uh, did the uh, genetic uh, evaluations, but looking at increasing from 250 to 290 pounds. What was the the cost of that compared to the additional revenue. And you can see uh, in this situation where feed cost is low, um, we've got still, we have a couple of situations here where it didn't make sense to add weight onto those pigs. But in the majority of situations, uh, you did have increased revenue compared to that. However, when we have high feed costs, which would be top of the yellow here, relative to, to, to hog revenue. Uh, then we had uh, essentially all but one of these genetic lines where it did not make sense to add that, 
that uh, value. So in other words, there's one genetic line here that, uh, be it the, the, the leanness and the lean growth level of that animal and obviously efficiency of that growth, that one line, it, it did still make sense to add that weight, but all the other lines in that high feed cost situation, it didn't make sense. This is just kind of an example. Again, we can see this kind of variation in individual farms, and this is why you need to look at your own data, evaluate that, and then see where's that, that uh, ideal marketing weight that we should be um, getting. Um, also when you're marketing pigs, uh, consider feed withdrawal if possible. Um, feed withdrawal is simply removing feed from those pigs for uh, approximately 12 hours. It could be upwards of 16, 18 hours, but you really want to make sure pigs aren't off feed any more than 18 hours, otherwise you might see some, some uh, cartridge uh, shrink and issues there. We are not removing water. That's a very key point to make here. So if we're removing the feed, we need to make sure that water is, is still available for those pigs. But if we do that, we've got a couple of different uh, advantages. Of course, we're not spending the extra money on the feed that that pig would be consuming those last 12 hours. Uh, but also, those pigs are going to um, actually move easier and have less stress. And uh, we also are finding out that we, we can see some improvements in pork quality um, and also in safety of the pork simply because the contamination risk for those animals that are being processed is less because they have an empty belly. And the truckers like it because there's a less of a mess to clean up on the trailer, of course. But um, So here's an area where you, you've got an opportunity to save some dollars. Some facilities, some pens are set up where it would be difficult to do that. And one item I want to emphasize here is that we are not removing feed from pigs if some of the pigs in that pen are going to remain. We do not want to have any out-of-feed events for pigs that are not being sold because uh, that can have a lot of detrimental effects. What we want to do is, ideally, if you've got a, a pen set up, and if you can separate the, a, a third or a fourth of that pen uh, and provide a water source there, you can sort the pigs the night before you're going to gonna sell them. Move the pigs up there. Uh, it, it certainly makes loading uh, quite easy in the morning. But also that, that gives you the opportunity to, to uh, do the speed withdrawal and, and perhaps uh, save a few dollars in the process. So, um, again, just a summary, there's a lot of things to look at here. I don't have any, uh, you know, magic bullets here of, of, of wisdom to tell you. It, it, again, is going back and analyzing what we're doing, which I know many of you have been doing uh, quite a bit the last 10 years. Uh, but again, it's, it's a continuing process. We need to continue to evaluate and look for some of these opportunities where we might be able to provide either some extra value or reduce some, some costs that would ultimately improve our profitability over the long term. Again, sometimes some things make sense short term, but maybe they don't make sense in the long term. So evaluate the system in its entirety.